My name is Raul Singh, and I'm so excited to be here. Uh, Cassandra Summit uh, has not been Cassandra Summit for years now, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm also super excited that we're talking about AI. And you know, when, when they asked me to potentially tune this talk, because we decided to do these uh, you know, summits together, I said, you know what, there's going to be enough talks about AI. So I will cover a little bit of AI today. But my goal is to come across with three points. One is, you know, how do you design an open data platform that can withstand personnel changes, people coming and going, technology changes as technology comes and goes, right? Number two is, how do you do that in a way that future-proofs you for more and more AGI or AI coming down the pipeline? And number three is, how do you control this? How do you keep control of it? We're at an open source convention, uh, open source summit here. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily about everything happening to be running on your hardware, but it's really, do you have control over the software, okay? So the biggest challenge, um, you know, I think humanity faces is that people are gonna uh, figure out, you know, the, they gotta figure out how to steer at the computer while robots are to work, right? I, I think if you don't know that, trust me, even as smart as you guys are, how do you steer at your computer while robots do the work? You're gonna do it, because you're gonna be running a, an LLM-based application, and you're gonna be watching how it runs, right? Uh, half of this, this is a joke, but half of this is true. And this will come full circle when I talk about um, you know, how do you build a data platform that is AI ready, right? That AI can help with later on. But really, it's, it's about the knowledge management. It's, you can design a good data platform, you can have the right engineers, you can have the right technologists, but how do you manage this process of designing and building so that new people can come and help you design and build? And at the same time, you as an organization become an expert on that platform. There's no two platforms that are built the same. Every single platform is different. And, you know, uh, we work with Datastax a lot, and, um, you know, Datastax being a product company, they're always like, this is our product and it can solve these problems. I'm like, yeah, but this is the industry and this is their problem. How do we solve it? How do we work back from that? So I'm going to cover a playbook for how do you design a platform, uh, an opinionated framework for uh, reference architecture, and the approach for knowledge management. And we're not going to get to the migration use case, but we're going to look at a standard data fabric, and we're going to talk about cloud versus open, cloud, uh, open source or open core. Uh, these badges you can collect later, but there's three badges I'm going to give you. Uh, the deck itself, <laughs> uh, you can get this deck. Uh, there are going to be high resolution images of the things that I'm showing that I think will be useful for you to take a look at later. Um, and then a link to uh, a boot camp that I'll be doing um, around generative AI, uh, specifically with modern data platforms in the mix. So our company, Shameless Promotion, we, we help platform owners go beyond their potential. That's why we work with Cassandra, because uh, Cassandra is infinite. Um, and we do this using our playbook, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. And our playbook is, is basically a set of principles. Okay? Uh, we work with a lot of logos that you probably interact with, and these logos, they end up using uh, databases like Cassandra uh, because that's the only database in town at that point that, that'll work. All right? um, at the end of the day, you know, we, we look at our company as a people and knowledge company. Ultimately, we're solving problems for people. We're solving challenges. Modern technology is very disconnected, right? Um, this is a picture from 2020 of the marketing technology stack. And in a consumer-oriented company, the marketing stack is where a majority of data comes from. And how do you consume and how do you process that information so that it can help you make decisions, right? And, and then, you have on the, the, the bottom right side, this is a tech stack of all of the open source LLM frameworks and tools and AI tools that are out there. So technology just keeps getting more and more complex. Not because the technology itself is becoming complex, there's another player, there's another player, there's another player. But what do most people need? Most people, they just need a way to find information, right? Analyze it and act on it. 
it's usually these three things, right? And I joke that, you know, database technology is been the same. Get, get your stuff into the database, get your stuff out of the database. But as people use it, it's about retrieval. It's about finding visualization, one way to do it. Analyzing the data could be one way to do it. Um, and acting and sharing on it could be another way to do it. And just put in the back of your mind, ask yourself, where does the AI fit into this? Because the AI can help with that stuff. Business platforms, uh, mature business platforms, they actually cater to four different kind of audiences, employees, partners, customers, and let's just say things, and I would maybe add AI later on, um, as services that are going out to people. It's, it's a customer experience. If it's a information system like a CRM, if it's a business intelligence dashboard, right? I didn't make this diagram. This is from Gartner's uh, you know, business, business technology digital platform or something like that. And big companies have hundreds of systems that they have to organize in order to have a business platform. And for me, the nirvana is all of your stuff together, all in one place, so you can find it, use it, share it, and going beyond the 12-factor app manifesto, which is, is the data available for the people at the right time? Is it available in real time when it needs to be? Is it available behind a password because it's sensitive information? Uh, is it up all the time? Uh, is there a recovery point objective and a recovery time objective of zero? Because that's what's possible with technologies like Cassandra. So this is what I'm thinking about, is if in a, in a uh, perfect universe, all the data being generated in an organization could be in one place, the ability for the company to use that data allows them to, with human hands, with AI hands, basically make decisions quicker, better, faster, to be cheaper and better than a competition. All companies go through this sequence, by the way. Um, you bring up silos, you create standards, uh, then you create standardized data, and then eventually you can uh, have standardized processes so that the company can do new things quickly. And the value of the organization's technology depends directly on how your optimized data core is being built and managed. Because if a company acquires another company, how quickly can they integrate that company's resources? It's not about the technology. Eventually, it's really all about the data. Today, companies are using things that are outside the firewall, right? They're using apps, software as a service, QuickBooks, Salesforce, et cetera. The standardization is about containers. It's not about you know, Windows versus Mac versus Linux. It's about, are we using Kubernetes or are we using Kubernetes? <laughs> uh, and the optimized data store uh, uh, is, you know, I think, a little bit harder to handle because not every database can handle every problem that you have. Um, and if you're a big company, you can't just get you know, one database, right? You, if you're a big company, you can pay millions of dollars and get Oracle. But if you're a company that wants to scale in a growth perspective to be able to cater to millions and billions of users, um, you can't go down that route. That's not going to work either, right? The goal is business to business modularity. How can you make your platform in a way that allows you to connect with those other people I just talked about, customers, employees, partners, right? And eventually things and maybe AI um, in a way that if the shifts in business change the direction of your company, you're able to pivot much quicker than, than if you didn't have this stuff together. Uh, generic data platform, you guys have all seen it. You know, data in, data out. Every data platform has some component of the scheduler, streams, batch, right? Data comes in from different sources. It goes out to different systems. What Cassandra does is, because of cross data center replication, it allows us to have the same data set being acted upon with completely different tools. So in this case, we're looking at one that is running Spark machine learning workload. We're looking at one using Presto for reporting and another one, and by the way, Presto can run on, or Trino can run on Spark, so it's not like they're mutually exclusive. Uh, and then another one that's doing all the transactions, apps that are built on Node, on Spring, on Akka, right? This allows us to have this data fabric and because it's open source, you can choose to have this in AWS, in multiple regions in AWS, in different clouds, 
or half of it on your infrastructure and half of it on the public cloud. So these data centers can really sit anywhere. Talking about design, when we think about building a modern data platform, you would say, okay, what are you using for infrastructure automation? What are you using for orchestration? Actually, I say, let's step back for a second. Let's think about who's gonna be using this. What are the processes that they need to be um, you know, responsible for? And, and that's really where the design component is less to do with the technology and really to do with the business goals. There are tons of modern stacks out there, right? If you look for a modern data stack or modern data platform, uh, you'll find a bunch of things. They usually have Snowflake, DBT, Databricks, right? Spark. Um, so which one do you decide to use? How can you decide with this, you know, and then it just continues to grow. And every day you go, there's another logo that you have to take a look at. Our approach is to look at people, processes, information and systems as an inventory, and then ask, how are we taking this most important business process and making it better? The framework, it's comprehensive. It, it's about the user experience platform. What, what are we using? Uh, what data system are we using? Uh, what cloud are we using? Uh, and the approach is less programming, less scripting, and more configuration and automation. I can't obviously go through every single step here, but your company will have some version of this. The point is, can you take your approach to your platform and teach it to that person that's coming onto your team tomorrow? And then can you take that same approach and teach it to the LLM that's gonna be assisting, right? Because if you're gonna be scaling an organization, yes, you can always add more technology, you can always add more compute nodes, but when you need to make more features, it's gonna be people, at least for now. So we use a canvas. You guys have seen a business model canvas. You guys have seen Lean Startup Canvas. Uh, we use a canvas that basically takes two uh, dimensions, people, process, information, and systems. These are our contexts. And then responsibility areas. So you can basically inventory every single person or persona what are the major business processes? What are the major information requirements for those processes? What are the technologies that it's running on right now? To find out potentially, are there redundant systems? Are there processes that could be sequenced together? You can zoom in, for example, this is a design for a, a data platform where there were customers, business uh, owners, uh, engineering and operations. Every business that's of scale has obviously customers the business product owners, right? What are their goals? Well, in one case, it's to add data reports and integrate data, right? The business uh, product owners, they wanna release and support customers. Uh, developers and engineering, they wanna develop, test, release, and operations wants to support infrastructure. If you think about the goals of each of these users, they're not trying to fight each other, but sometimes it feels like that. But when you put it all in one place, you sh can show them that actually they're trying to do the same thing. Right? They're trying to help the customer out. And what we found out here is that there's actually very little overlap in terms of the data requirements between customers and business product owners versus the engineering and operations. And people were expecting there to be more overlap. In our framework, uh, we go through uh, a simple checklist. Uh, is it distributed? Is it real time? Is it extendable or open? Is it automated? And can it be monitored or managed? You can do an architecture on Amazon, public cloud, right? You can do an architecture on Microsoft Azure, public cloud, sure. You can do an architecture on Google, public cloud. Are they all distributed? Yes. Are they all real time? Yes. Are they extendable? Yes, they all have open, uh, usually they're all open in terms of APIs, not open source, right? Can they be automated? Yes. Can they be managed or monitored? Yes, absolutely. So being a distributed platform does not mean that you have to use open source, 
But the case I'm trying to make is you should look at open source as a, as a priority because you get more freedoms when you're using open source. If you look at the ecosystem, there are tons of specialized databases that are out there. There's tons of streams that are out there. There's tons of, tons of stream processors out there. So how do, you, how do you use this stuff, right? There's lots of data modernization, automation, integration tools out there. Uh, who has done ETL with the no-code, low-code tools that are out there? Anyone? Like Airbyte or Grouparoo? Okay, I didn't think so. There's, it's relatively new. Um, in the whole ecosystem of business software, no-code, low-code, I believe that's the future, right? And all of these tools basically help facilitate automation and building of systems without too much programming. And when you bring it all together, I look at it as a computer. There's the major components of a computer, right? You have your RAM, CPU, disk, display, motherboard, operating system. And the way I correlate that is persistent queues for RAM or bus, right? Uh, queue processing for, uh, and compute for the CPU. Persistent storage, uh, per, a reporting engine for the display, orchestration framework for the motherboard, although you could argue that the data pipeline could also be that and a scheduler, uh, which is the operating system. And then there are strategies. There's cloud native on Google, for example, uh, self-managed open source, self-managed commercial source, uh, com managed commercial source, right? Y you don't have to take one approach to the other. You can say, you know what, we're primarily an AWS shop, and there's nothing that's gonna be better than S3 for what we need to do. We're not gonna bring up a MinIO cluster for S3, right? And you can decide to use managed Kafka services for, um, for Apache Kafka from, I forget, they, they change their name all the time. Um, and, but you know what? We're going to use Cassandra for our database. And we're going to use EMR for our, our Spark. If you have this grid of the different strategies with the different parts of a data platform, it allows you to make choices based on your business. There's a reason why somebody is going to be happy using uh, Elastic MapReduce for Spark versus Databricks, right? There's a reason why somebody would be happy using Google Dataproc for Spark uh, versus, you know, self-managing their own Spark cluster, right? These decisions aren't objective. They're all going to come down to a business and their goals. What this approach asks you to do is to do the homework. Look at the ecosystem. Look at the grid of what are the things that are really important in, in, in a particular business. This diagram is going to be available on the downloads, so we're not going to go into it. But in this, what I've done is collected basically all the open components for a distributed data platform and added to it things like no-code, low-code for ETL, reverse ETL, as well as low-code, no-code for user interface. And the goal with this is that when we are thinking about a scalable data platform, that we have a starting point. We don't necessarily have all of the choices made for us, but we have a starting point. And in here, there's Astra and Cassandra and you know, uh, self-managed DSC as an option because all three of those can do something very specifically. Uh, at the same time, for the query layer, we may end up using Snowflake in some instance and we may use Presto in another instance. And then finally, the approach. The approach that we take to managing platforms is making sure that we have at least one page for every component and every platform that has the following schema of knowledge documented. How do you set it up? How do you train on it if you don't know what you're doing? How can you do basic administration? What does the configuration look like? Where is it stored? And what are our external links to knowledge? It could be Jira tickets. It could be uh, a blog for an expert. It could be a YouTube channel, right? And periodically, a person that owns the component will go and update that. I know that this is a technical con you know, conference, but trust me on this. Knowledge management is a big differentiator between teams that perform and teams that don't, right? And I didn't even come up with that. Like, that's a McKinsey study. 75% more efficient if you have good knowledge management. But think about 
the AI that's coming. Think about prompt engineering. The more relevant data that you can give that AI to build things or maintain things for you, the better it is, right? So it's not just like you're preparing for today. When you start documenting systems in a structured way, you're actually preparing for the future. Uh, the full schema is available on the download, um, but it can go deeper. So if you want to go mature the knowledge base beyond one page per component, you could technically go and have a whole page per, pay, you know, per uh, section or a whole wiki, page, wiki site just for a stack for one component or one platform. Um, I separated it out basically into two sections. Uh, every framework has a platform and there are components that make up the platform and then there's extra resources. And so what you'll see here is that the components of a platform could be the infrastructure, the compute, the data, um, you know, the cloud components, uh, open source components uh, versus uh, you know, cloud native components. This may seem heavy, but if you do the work and you have a readme in your repos for every you know, system out there, you kind of already achieved this, right? It's really about having a structure in place that you can tell people where the things are. We talked about data fabric, fabric uh, very basically, um, but let me go a little bit deeper and I'm gonna wrap up. Um, getting data into Cassandra um, is hard. It's getting easier um, because there are lots of no-code, low-code tools that are out there. Once you have data in Cassandra, you can serve it up more easily today with things like Stargate, right? It creates an API on top of your tables uh, with GraphQL, uh, JSON REST, gRPC, uh, also document DB. And the idea of reverse ETL, which is a relatively new concept, you can do that today as well, where you take data out of Cassandra, low code, no code, and synchronize it back to your systems, right? And when you put it all together, what you have is kind of this unified data fabric that can bring all your data together for a business, process it together, and send it back to where it needs to be. In an ideal world, your users don't even have to use a new system because you could just be materializing information into the apps that they're already using. And then you can add to that LM engineering, right? Before LM rag engineering, ML was very hard, right? Um, now machine learning ops is optional, but what is it about this new kind of pattern? What is it? It's really another workload. It's a workload for getting data in, processing it with embeddings and storing the data. So if you think about the larger ecosystem of what's possible with Cassandra, it's not just you know, REST APIs. You could be storing features uh, for ML models and serving them up in real time. You could be training features uh, and, and models in, in real time. That's what Cassandra gives you. It's the ability to do all of this at once, in the moment, in real time, and not break at the seams. If you try to do this with any monolithic database, it's just not gonna work. And this is where, uh, at least in the vector database world, you know, the monolithic vector databases are not scaling because they're not, just not built like this, right? And because Cassandra's been around for a while, there's lots of tooling out there. There's an ecosystem of tools. When people say, why Cassandra? I'm like, okay, when there's key spaces at Amazon, Cosmos DB, Yugabyte, and Scylla DB all copying Cassandra, Obviously, Cassandra is doing something right, right? Obviously, Cassandra is doing something right. Why is it that CQL became the protocol for structured no, not only SQL? Who knows? But that it is what it is. Takeaways, I would say, don't reinvent the wheel. Ob just identify the objectives. Uh, I think a lot of times in the data platform world, uh, it's like, oh, we need to warehouse all the data. That's not the goal, actually. The goal is somebody using it. It's somebody using it for some job that they have, some goal that they have. Um, prioritizing DevOps and data ops. Automation is the key for a modern data platform. Um, people should not have to stare at their screens while a batch job is running, right? Um, they should not be looking at the log analytics 
you know, sitting in front of their computer to make sure a, a batch job is running okay, right? Or, an e or a real-time ETL, uh, you know, app is working okay. Um, use open tools, obviously it's about open platform, and then basically to document the stack. If you document the stack, you're gonna be fine. Thank you, uh, dream big. Um, the whole deck is available uh, with that QR code, and um, I can take any questions if you have. I knew this was gonna happen. So, I do a boot camp on large scale LLM rag engineering. Uh, you're welcome to go check that out. Um, we did one earlier this year with a partnership with Datastax. With so much that has <laughs> changed, we're gonna have to update it. But uh, the goal is to get people from you know, zero to hero, uh, you know, looking at the whole rag LLM engineering skill set and getting them up to speed uh, to be able to build a large scale LM application. Uh, quick preview of the agenda. It's uh, strategy and theory, uh, which is important if you're gonna be looking at this long term as a career. Uh, design patterns that are out there. Uh, there are no code and code LLM stacks, if you will believe it. Uh, and you know, building a custom uh, chatbot with uh, LLM uh, for your own data. Um, and you know, if you don't believe me, come to me later, but I built a production scale LM app using Astra and Bubble in an afternoon. So I, I know I can do it, and I know you guys can do it too. And with that, I'm gonna wrap up. So thank you so much for coming, appreciate it. <laughs>